Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for having me here. As uh, our announcer said, Microsoft is a bit new in the open source world. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Open Source Summit, representing 15,000 Microsoft employees actually contributing to open source projects in GitHub last year. Just a very quick intro of myself. Uh, I have just spent, I have just crossed my 25 year mark with Microsoft. I started as a developer uh, working on Microsoft Office product. Um, and uh, when I think back, the kind of transformation that we have gone through just a few years ago, as a developer in Microsoft, if you want to look at open source code, you will actually need to have approval from your VP to do that. That was not very long ago. And let me just tell you a story about, we open sourced our c -sharp compiler in April of 2014. So that's three and a half years ago. As we were getting ready for that particular plan, we discovered that we will have to go give the source code right of the c -sharp compiler that we built to another legal entity inside Microsoft. And I have to tell my compiler developers that they have to sign a contract to become contractors of this other Microsoft legal entity. And as you can imagine, the, my compiler developers were very confused. So they came to me, they're like, what does this mean? Does it impact my benefit? Does it impact my rewards? Why do I have to do this? I'm like, don't ask, just sign right here. That's what we need to get done. And uh, needless to say that we have come a very, very long way from those days and age. And that was really only three and a half years ago. And we have made significant pivot in such a short amount of time. And I'm really proud that you know, my team, my division have led the way for overall for Microsoft embracing open source in a pretty significant way. Uh, we have a number of very successful projects, including Visual Studio Code, including .NET, including TypeScript as part of the GitHub community. And we have also partnered very closely with many open source communities, as well as commercial partners in a broad set of open source projects like Node, like Kubernetes, like Linux, et cetera, et cetera. And today I'd like to share some of the lessons that we have learned in this rapid cultural shift and kind of uh, transformation that we have actually uh, been on. And while I think about the open source attempts that Microsoft tried to make, you know, a few years back, we were very naive. We really thought about open source meant source only. We were very focused on, hey, there's source code for developers to access and use. And we took the meaning of open source quite literally. And today, when we really think about what open source project actually means, we're looking at all the different aspects of being open and taking a much more holistic approach about thinking about this. And another story from our own journey, when we were planning to open source .NET, uh, which happened in November of 2014, we, when we were looking at what does it take from an engineering perspective to make that happen, one of the first deep realization we had is that we have to go make the entire internal engineering system available in the open. And this is so that once the source code shows up in GitHub, the community can compile the source code and run our tests to validate their changes and make sure that the compatibility is still there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So having the engineering system being available is actually a prerequisite of having a successful open source project. And for us, we had a proprietary engineering system that is Windows only. We have spent a decade working on it. So the effort of taking this engineering system, make it available, targeting, making sure it works on Mac and Linux, was an enormous amount of effort. What we ended up actually doing was that we decided to really sunset a lot of the internal tools that we were using and opt for open source tools by and large. And, but there were a number of critical core internal tools that we end up having to open source and make it cross-platform ourselves so the community can actually actively engage in the .NET project when we actually made it open source. And the second key decision when we look at the .NET open source effort was in how open we want to be. 
And it sounds a little funny maybe, but we actually studied many of the very large and popular open source projects to see how the development was actually being done. And you will find that some of the very popular open source projects, the way it was actually done is that the development happened behind closed doors. It was happening internally. And when we were done with a major release, the entire source code kind of get copied out to the you know, GitHub repo for the community to see. And, you know, and you're welcome to make bug fixes, maybe. Um, and then there are some other open source projects where the entire team will actually work in the open. So when we look at these practices, the decision we made is that we not only want to have the entire engineering team doing everything out there in the open, but more importantly, we really want to embrace the community in helping us in working our roadmap together. We want our roadmap to be designed in the open. We want the architectural decisions we make to be discussed in the open. We want feature requests and the prioritization and all of these design decisions to be completely discussed in the open. So that's a very different approach and mentality in approaching open from our early days of just thinking about open source. And needless to say, you know, work entirely in the open was a huge cultural change for engineering teams. We have a lot of seasoned engineers who have spent many moons you know, in Microsoft. Even with the best intentions, um, the team in the beginning really struggled quite a bit with old habits and behaviors. You know, Microsoft, for good or bad, we are a very email-centric kind of company. We love, we send a lot of email to each other, and we love a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. And for many years, uh, our product decisions were made in conference rooms, behind closed doors. The architectural decisions were designed and discussed on whiteboards in our buildings. So the question now we ask ourselves in this new open and transparent world is that how can we get a community to really understand the context and the rationales for some of these changes we want to make to the code base and really give us very rapid feedback in this whole process. And so we took, a, we made a many experiment on being transparent with the community. We seeded, and one of the, one of the best practices, if you may, that we're starting to kind of, you know, uh, using more is that we would collect ideas and discussions and topics and issues. We'll actually uh, get community to vote on some of the most popular requests. We'll actually put proposal out there and for the community to discuss. And um, as an example, the ASP.NET team would actually record a weekly stand-up every week to talk about what are top issues that they're facing, what is sort of plan for the next stage, and they'll just put it out on YouTube. And we get like well over 5,000 views every week. And then, you know, comments from the community about what they like, what they didn't like, questions, et cetera. And we have found that to be a very, very helpful uh, form for our own internal cultural shift from an engineering perspective. Because for our engineers, they are now, you know, with all of this engagement dialogue with the community, they're getting a really deep sense of what are the customer scenarios they're building towards. And they understand the impact of the source code change they're about to make. And they develop this more emotional connection with actually the users and community at large. And the other thing that we really benefited is this rapid and continuous feedback loop that we have. Even from the initial ideas, we get feedback from the community. And we, you know, for many of our products, we have you know, insider channels or preview channels where the community can get it very early, they get to play with our early implementation and give us feedback. And then once the product is actually released, many of our community members are actually our best product advocates and they help us you know, champion our the product. So we have, um, you know, with this set of changes, it really helps us to get a very fast validation of our plans and help us to de-risk the plans we're making. And the other element as we realize, just like everyone here who are you know, in the Open Source Summit, we clearly realize that you know, a community-centric approach brings a lot of value. Even then, I have to say that we were very surprised by the magnitude of the value we actually received. Let me tell you another story. Uh, also has to do with the .NET open source effort. When we 
after you know, going through a huge engineering system change and all of that, as I mentioned earlier, we put the source code out, we made big announcement you know, in our November event, and you know, we were top of Hacker News. And uh, one of the things we did to put the source code out is that we, you know, it was our intention to make you know, this .NET work on Linux and Mac. But our initial source code we released uh, had many, many gaps in terms of implementation, in terms of APIs, to make it fully functional product for Mac and Linux. Two days, two days after we open sourced the product on GitHub, we got a massive pull request from someone in the community which had the lion's share of the Mac implementation in his pull request. We were astonished because our own team, you know, they were kind of estimating it would take us a couple of months to kind of get to that level of completeness. And um, we were humbled because honestly, you know, being Microsoft, this is three years ago, when we put something in GitHub, we really didn't know whether community will pay attention, they will actually look at our source code. We were amazed and humbled by what the community has done. And from that moment on, it would really help us realize that just develop in the open, which means our own engineering team develop in the open, is just not enough. We really want to become community obsessed. And we want to really work on how we can make community an extension of our team. And really think about how we can make it super easy for the community to contribute to our repos, to raise issues, to have a dialogue. And so there are many different practices we actually tried to, you know, re to kind of achieve to that state. One of the things that we learned participating in other open source projects is that when we submit a pull request, sometimes it sat there for a long time and didn't really get looked at. So we kind of instilled an internal SLA to look at, like, you know, if the community making a pull request, we want to respond, you know, in like 24 to 48 hours and not let leave people hanging. And that's kind of the courtesy you will extend to your own team anyways, right? And so we're like, this is the same thing we will do with our community contribution. When the contribution come in, sometimes there's a very active dialogue going on the pull request. There's lots of back and forth. And we really work on give very detailed pull request comments about which part of the thing works, which part of the thing are issues. And I think that we have got really awesome feedback from the community that through this dialogue with our engineering teams, they got a much better understanding of the code base, you know, of, the, of the scenarios, et cetera. Uh, some of the other things we have tried to do is that we also put a code of conduct out there for our, for our, uh, for our open source project. This is to make sure that we really get the broadest, the most inclusive community participation. And you know, again, this is very similar of how we treat our own teams. And from a numbers perspective, we kind of rethink about what success metric looks like. In the past, as product engineers, we think a lot about how many new features we have released, right? That's, that's what we're really proud of. And now with a lot of open source projects, we also think about how many community contributors are part of our overall process. And so for things like Visual Studio Code, the team spends up to 40% of their time triaging thousands of community feedback and issues every month. And, and also, it's not surprising for Visual Studio Code, they're among the top 10 on all of the GitHub projects in terms of total number of contributors to GitHub, I mean, to Visual Studio Code. And for .NET, we're also very blessed that we have 60% you know, of our pull requests actually come in from non-Microsoft employees. And the number of the contributors in our top, 10, top 20 contributors are external to Microsoft. And so we really have you know, benefited greatly from the community participation and from our engagement with the community to lower the barrier uh, to participate. And as we transform from a, from a company, really, of kind of shipping box software, you know, product, which is built on proprietary software code, that's what we used to do, to a company that is much more open, that is cloud-centric, that really embraced community. We have learned, as I mentioned, many practical and cultural lessons. And initially, we also thought that many of the lessons learned were very unique to Microsoft. We were like, Ugh, we're kind of our own beast. And kind of much to our surprise, as we were talking to many of the enterprise customers, 
as we discuss their journey to have their own digital transformation, with their journey of embracing and use more open source, it turned out that maybe we were not as unique as we thought uh, we were. Many of the lessons we were learned uh, were very well um, or very applicable in the, enterprise, in the enterprise settings as well. Enterprises want to embrace open source. They want to increase the agility of their deliveries, and they really want to focus on you know, very differentiated value to deliver to their own customers. So the kind of concerns they have in terms of compliance, you know, scale, security, et cetera, are actually quite common. And we have dealt with many of these challenges in our own journey. So Microsoft has become a really trusted advisor to many of our enterprise customers in their own kind of workforce you know, transformation. And from those dialogues with our enterprise customers, we have also learned a lot. We learned that while they're very, very interested in using a lot of the open source software, but in the cloud context, they're really not particularly interested or invested to figure out how to take open source and operate in the production and planet scale. And you know, they're not particularly interested in figuring out how to take open source software and make sure it kind of meets all of the compliance and certification and all of these things, which are the backbones of being an enterprise. And so for us, the solution to that particular you know, customer pain point is that we actually developed a whole set of uh, managed services in Azure in our cloud, which is you know, developers can use MongoDB, they can use Hadoop, they can use Spark, they can use MySQL, et cetera. And by Microsoft developing a managed service, the enterprise no longer have to worry about doing these kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting. They can really just focus on delivering value to their customers. And another key area for us to focus on being really focused on developers is to say how can we really have super simple and productive experiences for developers to develop their open source and software or based on the open source stack. And a couple examples. Uh, some of you, you know, have been talking quite a bit about Visual Studio Code, which is our open source um, and, um, and a cross-platform editor. And you know, even from the get-go, we had great node development in Visual Studio Code. And one of the other extensions we produced is actually Go. So we see all of these you know, Go developers using Visual Studio Code. And uh, you know, they love the simple, productive experiences. And another example we have is that you know, from a service perspective, uh, we recently just G8 the, the, the Azure app services for Linux. So if you actually produce a, you know, your Linux, Python, whatever code in a container, you can very easily develop and test and deploy that with a managed service like app service and just erase a lot of burden of dealing with SSL, dealing with deployment slots, and help you make your life easier building on top of open source stack. So that's another set of value proposition we think that as Microsoft we can deliver and to really help the overall ecosystem. And um, as I also reflect and think about sort of like the overall role that .NET had to play in the overall customer adoption of open source. I mean, it's really not lost on us that among all of the popular you know, developer platform, .NET was the last one to become open source and to become cross-platform. And now we finally are there. We're actually very excited that we have really helped brought the overall open source ecosystem together. And it really enabled developers new and old to .NET to leverage this technology to be a broad part of solution that's leveraging open source. A story I'd like to share in this case is there's a, a very popular gaming company, the second largest gaming company in China. And the name of the company is NetEase. They were actually working on a new mobile gaming title uh, for them. And for a lot of mobile developers, you were, you know, in the game scenario, you, know, you might know that Unity is a very common platform people use, and the code to, to write for Unity is actually C Sharp and .NET. And so what they have done is that because we have made .NET open and cross-platform, they were able to now pick .NET as the backend implementation for this particular company, in the, for this particular you know, game, where historically they have always used um, you know, either Java or C++ in this context. So when they actually picked C Sharp and .NET, they actually got fantastic sharing of code between their front-end mobile games and their back-end 
sort of you know, backend infrastructure, they can reuse the entire Linux infrastructure they have previously built on C, you know, targeting C++ and Java in terms of monitoring, all of those things, and it just runs .NET code. So in this way, when the ecosystem comes together, our customers win. They really get to pick the best technology that, you know, that fits their purpose. So um, I just want to say that our, we're still on our journey of cultural transformation. Even though we have made drastic changes in a very short amount of time, we're far from complete from our changes. And we really appreciate your continued support, collaboration, and participation and feedback. And thank you for giving us feedback and help us being here you know, in the last couple of years. And we really look forward to being an even more active member of the open source community. Thank you very much.